Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for signing up to this. Uh, a rather unusual uh, presentation in that you can see me, but actually I can't see you. Uh, so um, I, what I've done is I've cut things down so that we'll spend about 45 minutes on this topic because that seems to be what people can, uh, can stand uh, on a webinar. Uh, so I'm going to hopefully show you the presentation. Hopefully that is what you signed up for. Um, so let's let's go straight in. Um, what we're going to do uh, over the next 45 minutes uh, is a little bit of background uh, on the battalion and on the, uh, the tactics. And then we're going to look at four engagements and trace the development uh, of uh, this battalion's tactics through those uh, four battles. So part of Iraq, part of Cambrai, part of the March Offensive, um, and then uh, Second Marne uh, to take a, a look at this evening. So a nod to Gary, who was on uh, last week. Um, probably the first person uh, really to set out how the learning curve worked. And this was an introduction uh, to thinking about tactics, particularly uh, in uh, 185 Brigade and in the 2nd, 5th West Yorks, because what all the literature seems to agree on is that in these four areas, there are considerable changes to the way uh, that the British Army fights. Um, however, in a lot of literature on the subject, the sources that are drawn on are very wide indeed. So you have thoughts on organization taken from one army or a different corps, many divisions are represented, and there's a going through to find examples that support the argument. But when you stand back from it, uh, what has been created is a, is a collage, essentially, uh, of different information from different places. And a lot of that rests uh, on things such as manuals. And while the manuals are wonderful, there's no guarantee that what the people in the field are actually doing uh, is what is down in the manual. So what I decided to do was to take an individual unit and look at these things, trace it through their battle history, and see whether we can pick out the story as time goes on, see how these things develop, and indeed if they actually uh, occur. So, uh, a very brief uh, introduction to 2nd 5th. This is a second line territorial battalion. Uh, so after the first line territorial start to go to France in 1915, uh, the second line are raised originally to take the um, home defence role and to take uh, as, really as replacements. So this is a, not originally intended to go and fight. Now, as casualties mounted, the second line territorials were uh, selected uh, to go to France. This battalion doesn't get there until January 1917. So they do their original training for France in early 1916 on Salisbury Plain at Lark Hill. Uh, and they are indoctrinated in the tactics of the start of 1916. Then they go uh, on hold to go to Ireland, they defend East Anglia, uh, etc. And they defend Bedford uh, until such a time as they are eventually sent out. And they are not retrained. So they arrive essentially with early 1916 training. And then they will fight in these four battles. So let's, without more ado, go in there and see how they do. I should apologize in advance for my French pronunciation, which is appalling. Um, so this one, Bullicor or Bullicor or Bullicor, whatever you choose. Let's take a little look at it. So this is the village, uh, very early in the morning, uh, say 90 days uh, since the, uh, uh, the attack. Uh, and I hope you can see uh, my pointer. The village is not a huge place. You can see the spire of the church. Uh, you can see the water tower and the main road going in from Ecoust. Now, if we then drop back in time, uh, and see it from the, uh, the Flying Corps aerial photograph, that water tower is roughly where the crater is uh, on your right-hand side. You can see the uh, wire, uh, three rows of it, uh, and these arrow-shaped uh, pieces of, of wire to funnel attacks. And you can see frontline trenches, 
communication trenches all stretching back up through the village and the center of crossroads in the village at the top here with the with the church so that is uh, the village of Bulkur in uh, April of uh, 1917. Uh, now, what was supposed to happen, essentially, artillery bombards the village uh, with a particular focus on that wire. Uh, it will be a combined infantry and tank attack. The enemy will be driven out, the village will be occupied, uh, and then the counterattacks will be uh, destroyed. It's a bite and hold type operation, this. What actually happens, uh, unfortunately, is nothing of the sort. Certainly for the second fifth, they lose all of their company commanders uh, and C Company pretty much to a man. Uh, on the day they know that they have 49 dead they, uh, and they have over 100 wounded, and on the day they've still got over 100 missing as they try and uh, reconstruct uh, the battalion at the end of the day. And having gone in at 3.30 in the morning, the survivors are back on the start line by 12.30. So you could look at this as an almost classic uh, Great War disastrous attack. Let's go into a little bit more detail. Here we have uh, Bulkor uh, with the road running into the town. Um, and that previous photograph was taken on the start line here. Now, what is supposed to happen... Uh, is that the Duke of Wellington's will break through uh, the wire on the left uh, and go through two Hindenburg lines um, and up into the support line. The 2nd, 5th and 2nd, 6th West Yorks will divide the village between them uh, by sending in a first wave of companies to take the front line trench uh, and then the second wave of companies will leap through and take the rear trench and then put battle posts out behind it. At this point, the Australians will bomb their way down the trenches from the right, doing up with the West Yorks, and the fortress village will have been taken. Now, that's not quite how it works. Uh, because as the second six move off, they are hit by machine gun fire from a tank in the corner of the village just outside here. Uh, which was left over from a previous attack, which the Germans have tunneled out to and made into a machine gun post. So these units that are attempting to get through the wire on the right are very badly hit um, and actually cease to be effective fighting forces. Other parts of the second six are pushed off into the centre of the village. Their subsequent waves do manage to get through, but they don't get very far through the village. So essentially the second fifth right flank uh, is hanging in the open air. The Duke of Wellington's uh, unfortunately find the wire uncut and bounce. So the left is also completely open. A company makes it through not only its own uh, objective, but up to an area called the Crucifix, uh, which was further than they were supposed to go because they were struggling uh, to maintain uh, the advance and fire. B company has to turn right to face uh, German attacks and the fight at the start of the village. C makes its way all the way through into the, uh, the rear of the Hindenburg line, and D makes it about halfway. This is by about 10 o'clock in the morning. Obviously, the situation for them is dire, because the Australians are taking some of their worst casualties from Gallipoli out on the right. And in order to not hit the Australians as they come in, the right-hand area of the village is not bombarded. So that area is open. This allows the Germans to start attacking down their own communication trenches back into the village. Uh, they come through the unbombarded areas. They retake their front-line trench, pushing the rem remnants of the 2nd 6th out. The failure of the Duke of Wellington's on the left uh, also means that they can attack down that front line and go into the side of A Company. And over the course of the next hour, uh, the companies of the 2nd, 5th are slowly pushed out of the village through a gap in the wire near the crucifix, uh, B Company getting out between 11.30 and 12.30, which allowed the Germans to retake uh, and join up again, reoccupying their own front line. That left approximately 75 men of C Company uh, who fight on, uh, but essentially 
uh, are destroyed over the next couple of hours. It's not a great start. So, what are we actually seeing? First off, this is a novice battalion. So, all of those officers, if they're in green, have no combat experience whatsoever. And we're being slightly generous on the subalterns there because mostly uh, those four gentlemen have patrol experience, but they've never been in a big battle before. So only Captain Peter, who's come over from the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, has had a battle before. They're also using a wave formation. Uh, so each uh, platoon is divided, is each platoon is divided up into waves, each, uh, forming company waves with moppers up which is complex to hold. If you are advancing down a football field, you can keep men in line uh, and you can keep spacings. The difficulty comes when you start to get obstacles. And as far as we can tell, when a line meets a narrow gap in the wire, what is supposed to happen is the line moves through that gap, reforms on the other side and goes forward. Now, on the day, the barrage was hitting a village that was essentially brick dust. Uh, visibility was down to about 20 yards, and the only way you could communicate was to cup your hands over the ear of the man you wanted to talk to and shout. So reorganizing as they moved forward through the obstacles was extremely difficult. You also remember what the village looked like. Well, after the heavy artillery had been at it for a month, the village looked like this. And what you can see here is the bottom left-hand corner uh, of the village. These darker areas are pulverized um, farms. They're basically, they're called the red patch. They're pulverized brick dust. You can see the remnants of roofs um, out here. Uh, and the photo reconnaissance interpretation chaps have marked out the frontline trench uh, for us, just in case we were going to miss it. So lip-to-lip -lip craters, the area had been devastated. Now, the first thing that happened when they realized how badly it had gone was they sat down to do the after action report. Uh, and the first draft of this is entitled Reasons for Failure. The draft that's actually presented is entitled Some Observations on the Events of the 3rd of May. So it clearly got watered down as it went through. But the first draft uh, from 62nd Division blames uh, the discipline of the troops, the fighting spirit of the troops, the failure of the tanks to support the infantry uh, properly, uh, and of course the Australians, uh, thus implying there was actually nothing at all wrong uh, with the plan at a uh, divisional or brigade level. It was the fault of the uh, of the guys on the ground. Now, when we step back from it a little bit further, uh, we can see that, for example, no patrol had actually penetrated the village. Uh, they knew that the wire was only partially cut, but they didn't know where the machine gun posts were. Um, and the aerial photographs uh, are oblique and taken from outside. There's not much detail. The headquarters that are supposed to be running the battle are 1,200 yards behind the lines uh, and basically incapable of communicating with the troops as they move forward. The tank plan is four pages long, doesn't arrive until three or four days beforehand, and there is very limited coordination with the tanks. In fact, when you put the tank accounts and the infantry accounts together, they might well have been fighting separate battles. Many logistical problems, uh, the supply dumps, for example, uh, there are different supply dumps for grenades, bombs, small arms ammunition, and Lewis gun drums. So if you need to resupply your platoon, you've got to go to four different places to do it, uh, which causes chaos. But to step back even further, this is actually what appears to be going on. They've attacked very much according to pre-SOM um, uh, doctrine, very detailed plans. The second six has plans that run down to the actions of four individual soldiers in order to take individual dugouts. Their platoon organization is, is incomplete. They don't have uh, the later organization with separate groups of rifle grenadiers, for example. And they may well have been using the old specialist uh, groupings within the platoons, which goes back to, um, for the geeky amongst you, pamphlet SS126 of uh, 1916, rather than the more modern uh, February 1917 organizations. The formation of line is extremely complex to hold. 
And the officers and NCOs simply don't have the battlefield experience to manage the thing as it goes forward. So there's a lot of things that go wrong. Uh, and they are very open uh, to learning from this. And so that you've got correspondence going backwards and forwards where the brigade major is saying, look, these guys, one, they're not properly trained. Uh, and two, a rather hurtful one from a territorial point of view, um, that perhaps the men hadn't fought as, as hard as they might have done, which I was inclined to dismiss until I found an eyewitness account uh, of a tank officer shooting British soldiers who were retreating in order to turn that unit around. Uh, the general officer commanding uh, was pretty clear that the COs uh, and adjutants needed to have their spine stiffened. So uh, there's a usual ironic tone of having particular emphasis. This is one of those interviews where you are standing stiffly to attention while the senior officer is lounging in his armchair and telling you uh, the facts of your character. No one enjoyed that interview. And so it was down in the battalion to Major Peter to start retraining and sorting this battalion out. And this is what they did. Obviously, they needed new command. All new company commanders, many new platoon commanders, a lot of them with MMs after their names, promoted from the ranks. They reorganized themselves down to three platoons per company. It's easier to handle, but they'd lost so many Lewis guns uh, during attack that they asked the maximum number of platoons they could handle. And Major Peter believes that a platoon without an automatic weapon is not worth having. The specialist teams, the bombers, the rifle uh, grenadiers, etc., are now no longer under the direct command of the bombing officer or the Lewis gun officer. They are now directly under the platoon commander. And it is up to the platoon commander uh, and the uh, platoon sergeant to fight the battle. And they are constantly trained in this. Uh, at some times, there don't seem to be any officers left in the battalion. They are all on courses. And when they're back in the line, they are patrolling and patrolling. Every night they patrol. Um, and they cycle it through the officers so that they are starting to get small-scale tactics experience. So that's Bull That's May of 1917, and it's not a very good show. Not long, November, they have a chance to attack again, uh, and it's another potentially fortress village for some of them. Uh, it is Pavrincourt. Uh, near Cambrai. So, what are they going to try and do? Well, the plan may look vaguely familiar. The outcome is very different. Over uh, two to three days, they will actually break through two Hindenburg lines, a record advance, uh, certainly for the division, possibly for any division. Uh, and the Germans, particularly the 84th Infantry Regiment, uh, defending Havran Corps, uh, struggle to do anything beyond the company level. Uh, and the butcher's bill is 17 dead, which is remarkably small for a great war offensive. So let's have a little look. Uh, this is the village of, uh, of Havering Court today. Uh, this is Havering Court Park and Woods. This is the village itself. And if we sweep out to the right, you will see this space, the left hand side of the village. This patch of low ground here is deeper than it looks. It is called the Grand Ravine, but it's only a Grand Ravine for this area. It's not exactly the Grand Canyon. Um, on the horizon here, this patch of trees is the town cemetery. And moving further out to the right, a series of woods. There was a wood, a T-shaped wood in the middle here, which has since gone. Uh, these woods mark uh, just over the brigade boundary and on the right will be the 51st Highland Division. Again, if we go back in time, uh, these are the contemporary photographs, and you can see the chateau here, because the, uh, the trees were slightly lower at that time. Um, and again, you can see here uh, some of the uh, wire coming back down out of uh, Havering Uh You can see more clearly the buildings of, uh, of the cemetery here, and particularly this roadway, uh, which is referred to as the Sunken Road. Uh, and far out, you can now see T Wood. So this is the battlefield for uh, Havering Corps. Aerial photograph, again, thank you to Royal Flying Corps uh, with the chateau. And the attack will take place with the second sixth going up this way and the second fifth eventually going up this way. 
So let's take a look. This is the layout of the brigade, and this has been put onto the uh, a copy of the original uh, maps that they planned. So the plan was very straightforward. The second six will move up through the park, uh, take the village of Haverincourt, uh, and take a position on uh, what is referred to as the brown line, which doesn't come up well in photocopy. Uh, the second eighth will lead off and actually expand when it gets to the brown line and hold those positions. The second fifth and second seventh will then move up to the brown line and move on to take their objectives, which are actually beyond it. And of course, nothing of the sort takes place. The second six gets badly churned up uh, and stuck uh, in uh, the park in front of Havrincourt Chateau. Uh, not many of their tanks have turned up. They are caught in the outpost line and they have a terrible time. The second eighth, by contrast, uh, is preceded by 32 tanks um, smashing through on a front of about 500 yards, completely destroying uh, and routing the Germans uh, uh, in front of them. Those Germans then retreat out through Triangle Wood and the second eighth pursues them uh, out of their area uh, and out into the front of 51st uh, Division, who uh, are not actually there at that point, leaving a massive gap in the middle of, of the position, which in olden times would have been a problem. The second seventh just adjusts its position slightly uh, and comes up to its uh, rendezvous in the sunken road where it meets up with more tanks. The second fifth, however, in Femi Scrub gets held up because this attack has gone in so fast that the Germans are unable to evacuate their frontline positions. So uh, the second fifth walks into a series of machine gun nests at that point. Its flanks are unsupported. But in contrast with Bukor, it, 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 <coughs> excuse me, it notes that these were greeted with the traditional hail of rifle grenades. They took over 100 uh, prisoners and then continued on to their uh, rendezvous point in the sunken road, where they reorganized and waited for what was supposed to be a gentle walk through to the brown line where the day was supposed to begin. Now, once they had reorganized and were ready to move, the second eighth were moving up again on the right, uh, the second six still in the village. Now we're gonna zoom in a little bit because this is where it starts to get very tactical indeed. So this is T wood, maybe that was too quick. Here's T wood here. We're now gonna go into this space between Haverincourt and T Wood. Now, the second fifth is only operating on uh, three companies because it's lent one of them uh, to the battalions on the left. So they have come out uh, and C Company is leading them in a series of blobs uh, with B and D uh, following up uh, in a more formal artillery formation. And they move out of the sunken road. And as they do so, they're attacked from three sides. Moving up, C Company drops off a platoon, which turns right and under the command of a sergeant, attacks the machine gun post in uh, T Wood, taking it, taking a machine gun, which they put in a tank. That leaves them with two machine gun positions, uh, one to the front and one to the left. The one to the front, they bring up a tank. The tank storms that position uh, and the infantry follow up, going around the tank and taking it with rifle, bayonet and, uh, and hand grenade. On the left, the position was uh, more dug in. The Lewis gunners went firm, pasted it with uh, Lewis gunfire, brought up a male tank, which hit it with six pounders, uh, and then they went in and threw grenades into the position. They then moved forward, leaving their tanks behind uh, and took the position in the cemetery. Uh, they also overran uh, the uh, battalion headquarters of the 84th, uh, infantry regiment, uh, where Hauptmann Ville was still trying to conduct the battle while a tank uh, parked on top of his headquarters. So this is clearly a very different experience from uh, May in, in Bulkur. And why is this happening? Well, the first thing we see uh, is that within the orders, nobody really has to do too much communication. There's a set of events that have been worked out. So, C Company, who are leading, if anybody counterattacks, C Company will deal with it. 
The second thing we discover is that as the battalion has now acquired a typewriter, the boss can actually shout in the orders. So uppercase, the tanks will not be an excuse. And this phrase, trusting in its own power of offensive, the battalion will fight through, irrespective of whether the tanks show up or not. And everything is about speed. Get them on the run and pursue them. Do not worry about your flanks. Do not worry about the support. Just keep going. Well, how are they doing this? Well, they're operating in a new formation, as I, I mentioned. This artillery formation or diamond formation. Uh, so they have now adopted the 1917 formation. So what this means is the platoon is divided into these four sections of riflemen, rifle grenadiers, uh, Mills bombers, bombers, uh, and Lewis gunners. So why is that important? It's important because... Previously, if you were attacking in line and you had to wheel that line or something happened on the flanks, it was extremely difficult to deal with. Now, the platoon commander commanding these four sections, irrespective of where he's hit from, and let's assume he's hit from the right, only has these four cards to play. So hit from the right, uh, he can drop his Lewis gunners back and open fire on the enemy that has come in. Uh, occupying their attention from uh, two, three hundred yards if, if necessary, which gives him the space to move his rifle grenadiers back um, and using what's called the infantry's howitzer, uh, he can actually start lobbing stuff from above. That gives his riflemen time to get in position and open fire and his bombers to come up. The bombs go in, the infantry attack goes in and the position is captured. Now, whatever angle he's attacked from, including from behind, he can simply move those cards around uh, and he will be able to, to deal with it. They're also re-equipped. So there's a huge contrast here between the amount of small arms ammunition they've got, between the number and the, uh, the a number of Lewis guns. And particularly, there is a, uh, a difference in the number of grenades. If you look along that line, the battalion probably went in at Bulcourt but, uh, over 500 strong with only 150 rifle grenades. On the day uh, at Havering Corps, they took over 3,000 and they had another 3,000 in reserve. Uh, and these are not Hale's rifle grenades. Uh, they are variants of the Mills bomb, the 23 and 24, and they are also white phosphorus uh, in the 27. Now, the Hale's rifle grenade uh, is extremely dangerous, uh, although not to the enemy, because it's more likely to go off in your hand than it is when you fire it. And I hope you can see that here on the ground in front of Bulcourt are a number of Hale's rifle grenades which did not go off on the day and didn't go off in the hundred years of planning since. So they're really not terribly useful. But with the new rifle grenades, they can stand back up to 80 yards and drop the things pretty much where they want. They've also been told not to bring them back, so they're expected to use them up. So when we see over 3,000 rifle grenades and discharges, we know that they are actually attacking in a very different fashion. So what have we got here? Retrained, highly flexible infantry. They've got more weapons. They've got better weapons. They have a small-scale tactical tactical doctrine about how to move these units about. Better formations, better barrages, huge cooperation with the tanks, uh, with units moving directly behind them. We have eyewitness accounts of this and almost complete control uh, at a very junior level with NCOs actually taking an entire platoon and conducting a, a platoon attack. The headquarters is walking uh, forward with them, about 200 yards behind them. So if they do need to communicate back, it's very quick uh, to do that. There's also, they've been trained in aircraft support. Now, there's no evidence they did actually call down airstrikes, although the Germans of HE4 Infantry Regiment complained that they did have airstrikes going in uh, at the time. So, halfway through, I hope some of you are still with me because I can't see you. Um, but here we go. Let's go to Bukoy. So this is Bukoy. Um, another, uh, this is a Royal Engineer panorama uh, shot taken from Stuff Redoubt, for those of you who, who haunt the Somme. And the village of Bukoy is behind these trees. Uh, I need to draw attention 
to the land, which rises gently up to about here and then falls away down to the fields in front of the trees and to Bukhoi itself, uh, itself, because the strand is very important in this fight. Um, so situation here uh, is that the Germans have launched their offensive. They have uh, essentially broken through. Uh, and the second fifth, which was uh, in reserve, minding its own business, was rushed forward by bus and then on foot. Um, and it was actually taken out uh, much further than its position out here in uh, almost the Long East Wood. Uh, and after it had been digging there for five or six hours, uh, they were told to move back um, and to dig in again here in, in front of Bukoy. This is how we do things in the infantry. Viewed today, what you can see is that the positions that they had were essentially in line uh, in front of what is now Bukoy uh, uh, Cemetery. And they were able because of a slight rise in the land, to get D Company behind A Company and firing over its, uh, its head. They had very little information about what was coming, uh, but they dug and they waited. So what's the plan? Well, actually, we don't know. Uh, most of the orders were uh, clearly done on notebooks and didn't survive. They didn't know who was coming. Uh, they didn't know where they were coming from. All they knew was that they had to create a defensive line, uh, and not go back any further. And indeed, they didn't go back any further. Uh, we don't know what casualties they caused, but the battalion believes it was the best day's work that they ever did, uh, and they lost 21 dead in the process. So how was that achieved? Well, the first thing that was notable is you will see the date of this, uh, about three weeks before they had to do this, this was their training uh, scenario. The enemy have broken through, uh, there's a gap in the line, scattered parties, you have to counterattack and re-establish our line. So they had actually trained for precisely this scenario. They also have a very different uh, organisation within the battalion. So, again, Officers in red have combat experience. Officers in blue have no records. There was no one, as far as we can tell, present on the day who had not been in a big battle before. And some of them have done an awful lot of work indeed. Second Lieutenant uh, Komoda, I hope you can see the pointer, um, who has DCM, DSO, MC, and Bar, also mentioned in dispatches. Still a second lieutenant because he's not yet 21 years old. Uh, but it is a highly experienced crew under the colonel who had led them uh, at uh, Haverincourt, uh, who is himself uh, an experienced regular officer. And this is the ground from the point of view of the frontline units of the 2nd 5th. Now, that's probably not considered the most exciting photograph you've ever seen, but let me explain why it's important. Because in the photograph here, we have inserted... Uh, then Army Cadet Skiro, uh, and you can see from where he's standing that you can't see his knees. If he walks back about 20 yards, he's invisible. So the attacking Germans cannot see the position that they are attacking until they are about 200 yards away. They have to go over the top of this hill and down the slope to the front. And into that slope are pointing the following weapons. The Lewis gun sections have been doubled up. They may not quite have 36, but they are getting there. And as other units retreated through, they, if you were a rifleman, you were allowed to go about your business. But if you were a machine gunner, you were nabbed and put in the line. So there are eight additional Vickers guns from 40th, four from 42nd. And it so happens the 62nd Division Machine Gun School is at Bukoy. So uh, lessons were cancelled for the day, and those guns were run up. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, if you do that in rounds per second, those weapons can fire 2,900 bullets into that space, which is a rate of fire similar to you get uh, from a modern attack helicopter uh, firing uh, with a minigun. So it is absolutely devastating. And the Germans attack five times over that ground. Now, you also say, well, if they can't see us, we can't see them. 
So roughly where William is standing is where Second Lieutenant Commode placed himself. He stood on the ridge, uh, and when the enemy attacked, he ran down the slope and covering the front line. And when they retreated, he personally pursued the enemy, uh, shooting five of them uh, with his rifle. So what changes are we seeing here? Training. The training was spot on. It was exactly what was expected. Tactical flexibility, they pushed forward, they then chose their ground. They chose a reverse slope, perfect for defense, fell back and uh, entrenched it. They did not defend the village, which is where most of the artillery fell, uh, because that was the, be the obvious thing to do. They based the whole of their defense around machine guns. Uh, they improvised positions, they acquired them from elsewhere, they placed them in forward in enfilade positions and created a perfect killing ground. They also had officers who were quite clearly willing to lead from the front and in what was a very young battalion, some of those private soldiers, to see personal heroism like that of Second Lieutenant Commode must have had an inspiring effect on them. It certainly inspires me. So this development is all going very well. So let us then go down to Marfo. Now you may not be familiar with Marfo. Um, uh, it is on uh, the river Ardre, uh, which is down in the Champagne uh, region. Um, and in July, two divisions, uh, uh, 51st and 62nd, were rushed south in order to assist the French with a counterattack against forces that had been uh, attempting to cut off uh, what I would call Reims, but I believe is pronounced Rhin. So the River Arda is in the bottom of this uh, picture, and to put it in perspective, you can easily jump across it. This is the dividing line between uh, the 51st Highland Division going up the left-hand side of the valley and uh, the 185 Brigade going up the right. Their target is the village of Marfo in the distance. Uh, I would also like to point out uh, the Femdata, uh, which was a significant strong point on the day. And for those of you visiting this battlefield, uh, the Femdata now does its own brand of champagne, um, which is why this photograph uh, may be slightly fuzzy. So what's the plan? This is a dawn attack. Uh, they will advance down both sides of this valley, eliminate a series of, uh, uh, of machine gun posts, uh, and take Marfo. It's a very straightforward plan, uh, and is not believed to be beyond uh, the abilities of, of these divisions. However, the orders don't arrive until very late, and the men have to make their way up down a very narrow trackway uh, from saint Moge. They don't arrive in position until about seven o'clock with the attack going in uh, at eight. So they do not have all of the equipment that they would expect to have. They have not had an opportunity to recce the, the position. And as they move out, they come under immediate enfilade from machine guns on either side of that uh, valley. They take 400 casualties, including all of the company officers, and unfortunately do not reach the objective. So let's take a look at what happened. Uh, there are no, uh, unfortunately, no battle maps of this, so I can't give you an original. Um, and on the day, there were no maps uh, because uh, there had not been time to, uh, to get them up. So basically, they were attacking to what they could see. DNA uh, in the lead, uh, C Company in support, and B in reserve with other elements of 185 Brigade around them. You will notice that it is not uh, by any means a Yorkshire Brigade anymore. Now, as they move off, they start to take casualties from the uh, first set of machine gun positions. And by the wonders of PowerPoint, uh, these units will shrink in proportion to the casualties that the companies take. So they move off and C has to be called up to support the frontline companies almost instantly. And we believe they took uh, between 250 and 300 casualties as they crossed the first piece of ground. Part of the problem is that on the left, the 51st Highland Division uh, is not in evidence, and that allows uh, machine guns in the farm um, and in this wood uh, to fire on the flanks uh, of the battalion as they come up. Now, the artillery barrage, there has not been time to bring up the 62nd Division's own uh, artillery. 
So the Italians uh, are laying down this barrage and the, uh, bear with me a second, I have to press a button here, otherwise my telephone goes off. Um, uh, the barrage is falling 1,000 yards ahead of the uh, infantry because they're not um, convinced that they can plan uh, a close barrage as they were used to in uh, France. So they have a tremendous difficulty crossing this piece of, uh, of ground. And although the 8th moves up on their right and takes out other machine gun positions, they are in a dire situation very soon after starting. Now, if you were a German machine gunner, this is your eye view. The trees center back uh, are the start position of the center of our lights. So there is no cover at all in this field. And worse, the corn was high. And so as the men moved through, they made a sort of um, V-shaped pattern in the corn, which provided a perfect target. So it is extraordinary that they did manage to take that first machine gun line. Having got there, they were then faced essentially with crossing an auditorium, with going across here with the machine guns on the stage. There was no way on earth that they could do that, so they manoeuvred. They gathered together a composite, essentially a composite company out of everybody that was left, and they decided that to cross this open ground in a straight line uh, with machine gun fire from the left was going to be impossible. Now, there is just the other side of the road, probably the only piece of dead ground on this battlefield. So they decided to slide right, get into the dead ground, and open fire, is now conjecture, to open fire on this wood to support 51st uh, when they eventually got there. Um, however, uh, by the time they took up that position, there were only about 70 men left. Interestingly, the position that they took up, where they took further casualties, is now the site of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, uh, Cemetery uh, at uh, Marfo. They couldn't get out until the next night. But what we do have, when uh, they were evacuated back through the lines, because uh, the rest of the division and 51st did eventually come up. Movingly, the messages that were sent back uh, during the battle have survived in the archives. So what you're seeing now is handwritten notes on officers' notebooks, which were brought back by runner uh, to BM Riley, who was the intelligence officer. So A Company uh, have been in action for two hours, and they're pinned down on the road, by the roadside. He has only 20 men. Uh, whereas D Company, who are down by the river, uh, have got very few men indeed, and they are stuck in a couple of, uh, of shell holes. They've had no contact with 51st uh, on their left. They want to know what to do. B Company, which is in reserve, has lost all of its officers within a few hours. Uh, they have no um, uh, stretcher bearers. They have only got about 16 men left. Uh, and finally, final message from D Company, who continued to push forward, is the rather chilling snipers on all sides. So clearly, this has gone terribly wrong. But we have seen in the previous uh, pieces that they are perfectly capable of attacking and defending and attacking very heavily defended positions. So something has clearly gone wrong. Now, the order of battle is no different. The difficulty is that what happens when it looks like this? Because the officers in grey are either killed or wounded very quickly, or they are called what, what's called left out of battle. There was a feeling that this was not going to go well. And in order to rebuild the battalion afterwards, they left out two of their most experienced company commanders and a cadre of men to make sure that they had something left. So some of these companies are not going in with their traditional leadership. Battlefield leadership should have been fine. The formations are as we would expect. The platoon organization is as it was. We have the um, uh, battle orders, and HQ is actually so far forward that they can see the battle uh, from where they are. Battlefield communications, as you've seen, were very good. Uh, those notes are getting back, and officers in quite difficult um, uh, positions 
are perfectly confident uh, that they will get instructions as, as to what to do. However, once again, we have some missing components. So no officer has had a chance to look at the ground properly. There is no patrol intelligence as to where those machine gun uh, positions are. As a result, you cannot bring a barrage down on them, nor can you take them out beforehand. The choice of ground is the enemies. Uh, and to advance down a valley when the heights on either side have not been taken uh, is a very dangerous enterprise indeed. There are tanks on this battlefield, but they are French tanks and they are supporting French units. The barrage we have mentioned and the immediate support arms. The biggest machine guns are still stuck back on the track. They won't arrive for another day. The spare Lewis gun ammunition is on the carts, stuck on the track. And immediately to the left is a cross division boundary. So there was no way to communicate effectively with the 51st uh, and potentially delay the start. So these are very serious things. Now, to return then to our original question, what actually changes uh, after the Somme? This was, was what we asked ourselves. Do we see changes in, in these areas? Um, and I, I hope uh, that we have displayed uh, that you can see increasing tactical ability um, in all of, uh, of the areas that we looked at within this one battalion. Um, and you can see how for, between uh, Bulkor, uh, particularly Haverincourt, increasing sophistication of what they were able to do, how they could use their support arms, how they could fight an infantry battle or a tank battle or a defensive battle, actually without too much um, chopping and changing around. The doctrines were there. The problem, however, and I'd like to go back to that phrase that this battalion uh, will move forward under the power of its own, of, under its own offensive power, is that although the infantry is becoming self-sufficient, it's becoming flexible, it's becoming sophisticated, actually it's getting a formula together for how it fights. And that formula starts to be a source of weakness because if you take the tanks and the support arms away and you still believe you can take the thing with the bayonet, you are going to be horribly punished. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope some of you are still with me um, and I hope that that was uh, informative um, and uh, as entertaining as it's possible to be uh, given this format. Um, and if there are any survivors who would like to ask questions, I will do my, my best to answer them. Fraser, that was absolutely tremendous. Thanks very much indeed. And I can confirm that everybody's stayed uh, entirely with us. We, we've still got uh, knocking on for 330 participants. So I know we can't do a round of applause, but if you'd like to raise your hands if you enjoyed that, um, just as, as some kind of uh, visual um, uh, representation of, of the enjoyment that uh, I for one have had on that presentation that is tremendous so we've got absolutely everybody raising their hands there virtually that's, oh, that's, that's nice. super Th thanks oh, so much what I don't know is whether I had a, a comment earlier that the battalion flag was the wrong way round so I hope I've now switched it it, 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 it is fine it is fine okay. Fraser. That, that's tremendous um, if, if it's all right Fraser we, we, we've got um, a, a number of questions coming in thick and fast um, we, we are talking about a learning curve so I'm going to go up a personal learning curve here and, and rather than reading out the questions um, I'm just going to try something now hopefully everybody's going to be all right with this but what, what I can do is actually promote the people who are asking questions to be seen and heard so rather than Rather than reading out the question, uh, hopefully everybody's going to be all right with this. Um, if you're not, uh, and, and we'll um, um, read out your question. But I'm going, to, I'm going to kick off first of all with Tim, Tim Walton, who um, answered, uh, asked the first question. So I'm, I'm just going to, uh, let's see if this actually works. Bear with me. So promote Tim to panellist. And if you, and I should also... Um, Asked to unmute, so there we go. Tim, hello there. Uh, you asked the first question, so um, let's see if this works. Do, do you want to just ask, ask Fraser your question there? 
Um, an absolutely fascinating presentation, Fraser. Thank you. Wonderful listening to you. And I think we could probably all listen to you all night. Um, it's interesting to see how tactics uh, moved forward during the course of the, the fighting um, and, and took our infantry battalions with them. What I'm particularly interested in is whether there were similar moves in the rear areas to bring back the wounded uh, so as that they could be dealt with speedily, either during the course of or immediately after the battle. Right. In the after action reports, um, there's a paragraph about medical arrangements. Uh, and both at uh, Havrincourt and uh, at Marfo, uh, the divisional commander is very scathing uh, about the speed at which um, the casualties were evacuated. Um, and the actions of the field ambulance. He didn't think that they were anywhere near far enough forward, and regimental bearers and battalion uh, stretcher bearers were having to be used to, uh, to get the men back. So that's not... That I can say from the data. Uh, I can't actually uh, give you chapter and verse on, on how they were um, reorganising themselves further back. But it was a a subject of considerable irritation uh, at Divisional HQ. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th thanks for that. Tony, I'm going to uh, unmute you. Um, Tony, hello there. Um, can't see you, but we can probably hear you. Don't ask your question, Tony. Um, right, yes, sorry. There we go. Is that? I don't know. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're good there. Yep, yeah, that's right. good, Tony. Okay, fine. Tony, um, you're very faint. Can you shout at me, please? Yes, okay. Can you hear me now? That's right. excellent. Um, I may be a bit off subject because I put the I put the question before you even started talking, so I'm <laughs> sorry about that. But um, going back to uh, October 1914, when um, they were dug in in front of Polygon Wood, now they were in shell scrapes, and there was three or four guys in each shell scrape, and they um, they repulsed the, the Prussian guards. And the Prussian guards thought they were being fired at by machine guns, but it wasn't. It was just a normal 303 rifle. Going back in time, I hear that the, uh, the infantry asked for more machine guns per battalion, but the politicians wouldn't give them that. And so the director of infantry brought in a pay scale whereby um, – the infantry had to fire 17 rounds a minute, aim shots, and then they would get a pay upgrade. So I th do you believe that that really gave us that musketry, which was some of the best in the world when we actually got the BEF out, out there in, in, in 1914? Sorry if the question's a little bit away from um, the, the subject, a little teeny bit. The, um, the it is interesting. People fall more and more in love with the machine gun. And the formation of the machine gun corps was an extremely unpopular move because the, the Vickers guns were no longer under, under battalion command. The standard of musketry that the BEF were capable of uh, was very high indeed. And I've taken that test and I can pass it with the Lee Enfield, but it certainly hurts. By the time you get to the young conscripts of, of 1918, there's huge concern that actually they don't use their rifles very much. Uh, they would far rather use um, the Mills bomb and the rifle grenade, uh, and the rifle and bayonet are, are best avoided. And enthusiasm for the rifle and bayonet increases the further away you get from actually having to use one. So uh, the attacks are uh, having core and, uh, and, and uh, certainly at having core, the German witnesses talk not at all about rifle fire. They talk about machine guns, and they talk about bombs, uh, and they talk an awful lot about tanks. So standard of musketry, I think, clearly declines, um, and the training is much more focused on uh, a platoon which is not made up of riflemen. It's made up of specialist bombers and machine gunners. Th thanks for that, Fraser. I've actually muted Tony just in order to... Uh... Move, move on to the, to the next question, which is going to be Stephen, Stephen Manning. I'm just going to unmute you, Stephen. So, um, Stephen, your question, please. 
Thanks very much. Good evening, Fraser. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, at the beginning, you said that to address some of the issues of inexperience, uh, they promoted from the ranks, and I'm assuming that the proportion of those were NCOs. And then a bit later on, you made a specific reference to an NCO leading a platoon in, into a battle situation. So I just would be interested if you could shed a bit of light on how NCOs influenced what we might call the interior management of the 2nd oh. fifth. How active were they? And what, what, and what, were you able to find much primary evidence of that? Yes. Um, now, having been rude about um, manuals, uh, what we do have is some of the training regimes. Uh, and when uh, subalterns were on training courses, they were on, uh, those courses were um, shared with sergeants. And the tactical exercises that they are, they are, uh, are doing actually could easily be taught at Sandhurst now. So it is the classic, uh, you are uh, advancing across this piece of, of open ground and you are hitting this strength from this direction. You will now write your orders. So uh, subalterns and, uh, and uh, NCOs are being trained in exactly the same fashion uh, where there are no subalterns to take over. Uh, a sergeant will easily take over a, a platoon and carry on. Um, and you find evidence of that quite often in the decorations and uh, mentioned in dispatches. And you'll see um, uh, after his officer was incapacitated, Sergeant so-and-so took over the platoon and maintained the attack, uh, often with a decoration. So this stuff uh, is, by the time of Havrincourt, perfectly normal and was going on in other battalions in the brigade as well, looking at their um, uh, honour rolls. So my own experience uh, is that certainly for the first six months, the main phrase that you need as a subaltern is carry on, sergeant. Uh, and you let them carry on. But when the fighting starts, those young subalterns were expected to be out in front. Thanks for that, Fraser. Um, hopefully that answers your question there, Stephen. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Let me just uh, move on to Roland, Roland Proctor. Uh, I think yeah. you're, you're uh, unmuted there, so do you want to ask your question, Roland? Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you, Fraser, for an excellent uh, presentation. Very interesting. Uh, so when you served in the regular army for nearly 40 years um, and did uh, the, the, one of the early breaking courses, which is between commanders, of course, what you say, and being an instructor at Sanders as well, uh, what you say, it, it, it's just funny how history has repeated itself and, it, and it's evolved to exactly what your train of thought is. It, it's very interesting. And I think the other comment I just want to make was, um, you talk, uh, we talked about Polygon Wood. Uh, Tony mentioned Polygon Wood. And you're quite right. Um, the, the BEF were all regular soldiers. Um, musketry was very, very... They were, they were top, in, in, in my regiment, the Black Watch, acquitted themselves quite well at Polygon Wood. And if you ever go over there, go visit the Black Watch statue, which you'll probably see behind me, uh, the, the maquette, um, which I was involved in erecting. But my question was, what ever happened to the Highland Division? Where, where were they? Why were they not, uh, why were they not on the left to support, uh, you know, the, the, the Yorkshire Battalion? Was, it, was there a, a mock-up in communications? Uh, was they just being you know, sort of laid back, or uh, was there a reason? It, it's a joke. For Combray, um, the war diaries of the battalions immediately to, to the right state that they started on time. So there's no written evidence that says that they weren't where they were supposed to be. But the battle reports from 8th Battalion... Uh, after they have broken um, 2nd Battalion 84th Infantry Regiment and are pursuing them, uh, they, the Germans are retreating up their own trenches. That takes them into Triangle Wood and then are off up towards uh, Flesquier. Uh, and so they pursue because, in their words, the 51st Division had not come up. 
Now, they must have arrived shortly thereafter because the officer commanding 84th Infantry, 2nd Battalion, 84th Infantry Regiment, Captain Soltau, uh, in his last stand, it is kilted soldiers that destroy his headquarters. So at some point, they must have bumped into each other. Uh, but exactly when it happened is unclear. The uh, situation at Marfo was that the 51st had had an even worse experience getting into position, and their records do say that they started late. They also walked into um, an absolute hail of machine gun fire, uh, and it cost them a couple of battalions before they could get up and take that strong point. So um, don't really know uh, on the first one, um, it may just have been difficulties of terrain and getting out of alignment, which, as you've, as you've seen, happened even within the brigade. On the second one, it was definitely conditions on the day. The difficulty is that communication between divisional headquarters to say, hang on for 10 minutes. Um, for example, the 51st is, takes hell of a beating in front of Flesquier, but the 62nd had got round it. If it had been possible to communicate, tell the first 51st to hold and face the 62nd right, Flesquier would have been nipped out. But that inter-divisional uh, communication was simply not possible on the day, although it did occur to 62nd to try. Thanks, super. Thanks for that, Fraser. I'm just um, going to now, Rachel Wilsden, I'm going to unmute you and... Um, you're live if you'd like to ask your question, Rachel. Hi. Um, do you think the Havinkle battle would have had the same level of success if the tanks had been knocked out, broken down earlier on, as in other battles? Right. I've actually been looking at this. Um, so, uh, because I recently uh, got access to the papers of one of the officers of the 8th Battalion, and he had kept in his scrapbook the original tank traces for where tanks were going to go. So when you see that, on the left-hand side, where the second six gets stuck, they're supposed to have six tanks, only three turn up, so half of their platoons don't move off because they know they can't break Hindenburg Line with neither a barrage nor with tanks. And over there, where they hit... Uh, third and fourth companies of the 84th, they are basically stopped dead for four hours. Their tanks can't get a bead on, uh, on the enemy. They don't have enough of them. They can't get close enough. On the right, the 8th has got 32 tanks preceding it and another eight for the second objective. So even if half of them hadn't turned up, uh, it would probably still have worked. But I think the critical piece of, of information is actually from the German side, because officer commanding 3rd Company of the 84th, who rejoices in the name of Dunkelgod, uh, gets back to um, uh, his HQ as Hauptmann Wille is trying to organize the counterattack. The whole of the 22nd, uh, 27th Regiment is about to come in, come over the railway embankment, and come smacking into 62nd. And Donkelgaard says to um, Ville, if they are not bringing anti-tank artillery, there is no point in them coming. So as far as the Germans were concerned, the big thing was tanks. And the test case within 185 Brigade is, if the tanks are not there in the initial assault, you will not break through. After a couple of hours, with tanks going everywhere and infantry all over the place it doesn't seem to matter as much but in the initial breakthrough and you have to feel sorry for the 27th because they were trying to form up when all those tanks came over the railway embankment uh the tanks were absolutely pivotal had they not been there on the day uh it wouldn't have worked one of the lessons learned in the documentation is uh there should be an infantry runner waiting with the tanks if the tanks are delayed, the runner will go forward and tell the company to wait. If the tanks are broken down, he will go forward and tell the company it has to make other arrangements. So clearly they're thinking about this stuff. Thanks for that, Fraser. Hopefully that's answered your question there, Rachel. I'm just going to now just flick along. I'm struggling just to 
remember who's asked the question or who hasn't, so forgive the uh, umming and ahhing on my behalf. Abby Walston, Abby, I'm going to unmute you there. Hello, can you hear me? We okay. can, Abby, yes. That's Hello, fantastic. Sorry I don't have a camera. No, it's okay. Um, I really enjoyed the way that you've spoken and I, the illustrations and the diagrams I found really useful. I almost wanted a little longer on some of them. I can but, go on forever. Oh, do, do that another time. But um, there is just some terminology I'm slightly unfamiliar with and it, it was the word en enfilade, is it? That I right. just wanted a bit of clarification about that, okay. please. So if you imagine a line of soldiers stretched out facing you, Imagine yep. 30, 40 of them in a straight line facing you. If you fire a machine gun directly at that line, you might get two or three in a burst, yeah? Yeah. But you're going to have to sweep your machine gun the whole way through to get them all, and that takes time, and they don't just stand there. Right. But imagine, instead of looking across that line, you were looking down it. So essentially, when you fire that machine gun, it goes through the first man, through the second man, through the third man, through the fourth man. That is what an enfilade is. And when you have got machine guns firing in from both sides into a formation that's based on, line, on lines, you will cause devastating casualties. Right. Does that make that's, sense? It does. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. I, I do have an animation of this, but I, <laughs> I don't, I'd have to go and get it. Oh, another time. Another time. Thank you. Thanks for that. Right. Okay. Let, uh, I don't want to um, take up oodles of your time phrase but I know that you I'm don't. not going anywhere <laughs> <laughs> okay let me just um, unmute um, where we are Graham Cobb right here we go Graham let's um, let's get you asking your question Graham I think you're live now good, good evening um, and thank, thanks um, once again I'd, I'd like to echo first of all the comments that have been made about uh, appreciation for a very clear talk and particularly the illustrations, which I think are really, particularly in this format of a remote dis uh, display, have been really helpful. So thank you for that. Pleasure. Um, I'd like to, to ask a query in relation to the comments you made about Marfo um, and the early stages of it when you were saying about um, it seems there is at least circumstantially some evidence that the British commanders knew there was going to be a disaster coming, pulled out their best officers, maybe some of their best and specialist troops, and more or less left the others to it, which is quite a cold way of doing it, although I can understand the logic of it. Um, I wonder, I mean, and particularly in, in, in the light of the comments that came in response to one of the other questions about um, the tanks hadn't arrived at Bull Corps, um, how, how often do you think it was that officers received an order that they knew was not going to work? They knew they were just going to take casualties and it wasn't going to achieve any objective. And then they found some, shall I say, creative response, whether it was, you know, well, we'll go ahead, but we won't send our best troops with them or we'll just refuse to obey it or we'll find some other way of uh, interpreting it, like only sending 10 men when it's expected to be 100. How often do you think that kind of dilemma was resolved that way? But interesting that uh, at Bull Corps, uh, the officer commanding 2nd 6th uh, did a very detailed appreciation of what his men were expected to do, down to uh, groups of four or five men, and pointed out that uh, one part of the plan uh, involved a platoon of uh, 30 men taking 250 yards of trench uh, with, I think, four dugouts in it. Uh, and, I mean, it is a superb forensic piece of analysis of why the Second Six attack on uh, Bull Corps was unlikely to work. The correspondence back from Brigade, um, the Brigade Major uh, writes to him to say uh, that the Brigadier is perfectly well aware that uh, his unit is under strength, but believes it has sufficient men for the task um, and offers a series of, frankly, facile suggestions uh, as to what could be done to, uh, to make it work. On the day, uh, Colonel Hastings was absolutely right, but his battalion still attacked. Uh, 
The 62nd Division at Marfo knew that they hadn't had time to prepare, but the whole French army was attacking at eight o'clock that morning uh, and they had to go forward. So they simply, in the end, had no choice. At a battalion level, the amount of creativity that they would go into to try and, and come up with something clever uh, is there every time in the, in the orders. So um, at Havrincourt, they were expecting that the moment the attack was seen, there would be a barrage on the frontline trenches. Uh, so even as the first waves moved off, the second, fifth got out of the trenches, moved forward into no man's land and took cover amongst the fallen trees. And surely enough, the barrage fell behind them. Uh, they then didn't advance behind the second six. They scooted off to the right and went through the gaps that had been created for another battalion. So that at a tactical level, they are ducking and weaving. Uh, but at the top level, if the battalion is going forward and you cancel that attack, you will not be in charge of that battalion uh, the next morning. Th thanks for that. Um, I'm just... Um John Lawrence, right, let me just unmute John. Thanks uh, very much, Fraser. John, you're, you're live. Go, go ahead. Right, thank you. Um, Fraser, thanks again. You know, uh, delighted with the presentation. Um, go back to your presentation on uh, the platoon commander moving his sections around yes. uh, to respond to tactical situation. What I'm interested in, um, in, in this in terms of my question, the specialization level of the individual members of the platoon, they arrive as replacements, at what point do they become bombers, grenadiers, riflemen, whatever? Or do, you, or do they arrive as a replacement bomber, a replacement grenadier into the platoon? Are they taught this stuff and sort of the, the people who are best at dealing with rifle grenades become earmarked for that role from the training centre and arrive at the battalion in that position? Or does that happen at battalion level? Right. A lot of this happens at uh, division. Basic training back in England, I'm not qualified to say, but the... Um, uh, the curriculum, as it's laid out in Notes for Commanding Officers, 1918, uh, trust me, it's a book, um, uh, actually is, is really very basic. Uh, and there's musketry and bayonet drill and then familiarity uh, with the other arms. When they arrive, um, they go out into the platoons and in the platoons they will be given a specialty. And then there will be uh, brigade schools and uh, battalion level training in each of those specialties. Uh, and you're expected to come up to, to speed pretty quickly. Um, but when you, when you start to look at the organization of a platoon in the later years of the war, everybody appears to have one or two specialties. So you might be a rifleman, but you might also be the section scout and a member of the platoon scouts. Um, uh, you might be a bomber, you might also have something else. Uh, and you are being trained in these and you move backwards and forwards. So I think there were some super specialists uh, and then there were quite a number of guys who were basically there to carry the ammo. So in a Lewis gun section of eight men, probably only two of them are allowed to play with the toys and the rest of them are there to carry buckets of Lewis gun drums. Yeah, I understand that, yep. Can I just make another point very quickly, Fraser? I was interested in your comments about Bukoy, because I run a website about 70 Infantry Brigade in World War II, and that's where it was. They were slaughtered on the 20th of May, and we've just had the 80th anniversary. You mentioned the cemetery. That's where most of the casualties are buried. Right. The, the second fifth also has soldiers in, uh, in Bukoy, both from uh, an earlier um, February 1917 fight and obviously from the, uh, the 1918 fight. Yes, I've, I've visited and I've, I've seen the graves, yeah. Thanks, Peter. And you, um, I'm going to unmute you. Peter, um, you're live now. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, good effort, David, with my surname. 
Um, <laughs> thank you, Fraser. Excellent, I thought, super presentation. Um, I have a question about training. I've, reading about the first uh, day of the SOM in 1960, um, yeah, 1916, you get the impression, uh, quite the strong impression, that certainly at army level, maybe even at division level, there's a variety of, of approaches to training, in, both in terms of what, what type of training and um, in what skills is delivered uh, uh, for each unit, and certainly the quantity and quality seems to vary. Is, is what your understanding is that that, that became more wide, um, training, the approach to training across the whole army by 1918 certainly was, was more consistent um, and, and more complete and comprehensive? That, that's certainly the impression that I get. Um, I've looked at the training regime that uh, the battalions, these obviously are territorials that have been uh, called up, were going through while they were in England. Um, and it appears to me to have been fairly basic. Uh, by contrast, the stuff that is being given in um, divisional schools uh, in France is very sophisticated indeed and very practical. Um, and certainly some of the, in the, the book I tried to show you, some of the training schemes in there just work fine. It, it appears, uh, and I'm not, uh, there are definitely experts on this, uh, but as time went on, the pamphlets that were being issued, um, uh, some of which I referred to before, there, there are pamphlets particularly about the employment of, of bombers, that's SS-126. Uh, they have a lot about what you do with bombers, but not very much about how bombers work with everybody else. By the time you get to February 1917, uh, and you've got SS-143, um, and a hierarchy of pamphlets above that, you're starting to get uh, the division in battle, the brigade in battle, the company in battle, the whole thing stacks up, and you can see how it all fits together. And it's really quite a coherent um, uh, tactical doctrine. Who's doing all the thinking about that, Lem Fraser? Um, well, I think the hero of training is Maxi, um, mm. but which I've probably again I did warn you about pronunciation, didn't I? Um, <laughs> the uh, I don't pronounce English very well either. Uh, uh, but that seems to be largely, I think, focused on Fourth Army. So it's a very long time before you get uh, a consistent approach to the way that people are uh, are, are approaching battle, um, and some would say that having achieved it by the end of 1918, we then set about forgetting it uh, before it had to be taught to us again in 1940. Thanks. I was just going to ask Jean to ask his question, but I've just right. lost him on just, the screen. Uh, so. be before we do that, the, uh, the young man who was offering a scale at Bukoy, uh, and this is a counterblast to the idea that second lieutenants are not particularly useful, has just passed out of Santos and has just brought me this beer. Um, so... <laughs> Second lieutenants, ladies and gentlemen, have their uses. <laughs> Good lad. Enjoy that. Um, okay, Jean, I've lost you on the panel here, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to keep people coming on board. Mark Armstrong, I'm going to unmute you, and then after that, I'm going to ask Mike Phipps. So, Mike, if you hang about, but Mark, you're now live. Do you want to ask me a question? Yes, thanks. Um, what we've seen in the in the centre of two battles that you mentioned there is one of the principles of war, and that is the concentration of force. What I don't quite get is how a battalion, which okay, it's been a garrison battalion, arrives at a battle that takes place in April seventeen, and yet doesn't appear to have learned any of the lessons um, that the British Army has, has has won in the previous two and a bit years. How was that allowed to happen? Right. The circumstances of arrival of the 62nd Division uh, are part of the problem. Uh, so they turn up in January 1917. They have not been trained at all in uh, any of the thinking that is coming back from uh, the front. The best they've got is a couple of officers who've been placed on attachment. They don't go anywhere near a trench until February. Um, and their first set piece attack, which is supposed to happen in late March, is cancelled. So they uh, have no opportunity to train. 
um, they don't have 11 of experienced officers, and that's actually worse at a brigade and um, a divisional staff level. So it's simply, I think, a conspiracy of um, uh, events. I can find no trace that the tactical pamphlets uh, that were being issued for training, uh, published in early 1917, had reached the division. Later, we find references to them in the orders that um, the battalion uh, will advance in X formation, and they give you a page reference so that you can go and, and check it. But at Bulcour, they are drawing the formations on pieces of paper in the orders. They're making it up as they go along. Thanks, Fraser. I'm just going to now unmute Mike. Mike Phipps. Mike, you're live. You want to ask your question? Yeah, hi, Fraser. Yeah, brilliant, uh, brilliantly informative presentation. Thank Thanks very much. Uh, I've got two questions, actually, if I may. Um, when the uh, attack was held up in Haverincourt and there were the two machine gun positions that were left, how did the infantry communicate with the individual tanks to take out those machine gun posts? And the second, the second question, if I may, is um, this doctrine, it's been touched on by one of the previous guys, this doctrine about left out of battle, where the officers in the uh, last attack that you discussed uh, were selected to be left out to form this cadre if, if the worst happened, who, who invented that doctrine and who had the decision on whether it was actually used in any particular circumstance? Right, so um, to the first one, uh, probably two answers. Um, what is supposed to happen is the infantry have been trained in a series of signals, and these involve putting a steel helmet onto the butt of a rifle and waving it backwards and forwards. Uh, in order to attract the attention of a tank, um, and then the tank will come up, and uh, what happens then is unclear. What actually seems to have happened is that many tank commanders did not spend, by any means, the whole battle actually in their tank, because they couldn't see anything. So in many cases, a member of the tank crew was actually walking outside uh, so he could see what was going on, um, and then communicating with the infantry. In both 62nd and 51st Divisions, the infantry were told to keep away from the tanks. They were supposed to be 100 yards away. But the German eyewitnesses' accounts say that was not the case. There were units of infantry right next to the tank. So my assumption about uh, what happened is an infantry unit would come under machine gun fire. Other parts of the unit could see that. And you simply wrap the butt of your Lee Enfield on the tank until someone noticed you or spoke to the, um, uh, the person who was there, fired a flare at what you were interested in, and the tank started to move. Now, the tank communication seems to have been very good. There are other battalions on the day whose flanks are left hanging in the air who come to a private arrangement with the tanks to sit on their flank uh, and give them covering fire while they're moving up. That's not in the plan. The final taking of Haverincourt involves tanks that had no business to be in Haverincourt at all, but had clearly come to a private arrangement um, with the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry that they would try out fighting in built-up areas using tanks. There's a hell of a lot of making it up as you go along going on out there, um, and it seems to be working. Uh, but those engagements on the eastern side of, uh, of Haverincourt are absolutely classic tank infantry cooperation battles. Thanks. Uh, Mike, did you have a second question? Oh, I'm sorry. And the second <laughs> question was, will you remind me? I, I get yeah. on a roll. No, 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 that was very full answer. So thank you for that. It, it was just in relation to this left out of battle doctrine. Ah, who yes. who invented it and who decided when and where it would be used? I have no idea where it comes from. Um, uh, and the only reason I discovered it was actually finding it in the orders for Marfo um, uh, at the brigade level. Um, and they, those came down to the battalions and they s stated that 
half of the there's more to it, but the line that sticks is that half of the company commanders will be left out of battle. Who is left out of battle? That's up to the colonel. Uh, it's interesting, he chose his most experienced and decorated company commanders uh, and men with a patrolling history uh, not to go in that day. Uh, and some of those companies were under the command of subalterns who were in their first big battle, hence the tone of the notes you're getting. Thanks for that. Right. Uh, Peter Monday, I'm just unmuting you there. I'm asking you to unmute yourself. I hope I'm not the only one who's taking to his... Uh, no, it's, it's my right. throat. It's medicinal, you understand. Just, Peter, I'm just trying to get you to unmute yourself there. If, if I can't, I'll, I'll come back to you, Peter. Okay. You mean me, David? Uh, no, Peter, Peter Monday. Peter... Okay. Okay, that's not that failed on the technology there. M Marie McCarthy, I'm going to un un unmute you. If I can, I don't know if you're still there. We, we might actually be just losing just a few participants along the way as the hello. questions. Marie, hello there. Hello, hello. I'm Marie from Cork in Ireland. Um, I'm interested in nursing in World War One, and I was surprised at the comment considering that it was 1970. 1918 that the services were deemed somewhat disappointing and I was wondering where would the hospitals why would this happen or have you any more information about this? Okay, I'm just right, I'm sorry Marie the, the sound quality on that was 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 pretty uh, difficult to catch I didn't quite catch the question I suspect for isn't I've got bits. Can we try again? Fraser, I'm interested in nurses in World War One, and I wondered why there was disappointment expressed about the services, considering it was 1917, 1918. I would have thought you would have field hospitals and good backup, and that this lead to maybe more casualties if the services were not up to on par. I'm just, I think, I, think go, I got the gist of it. Shall I have a go? Go for it, go for it, Fraser. Yeah. Right. So um, the business of, of evacuating casualties uh, from the battlefield, um, if you get hit um, in a quiet period in your own trench, uh, you could be back in a base hospital in uh, England uh, in 36 hours, um, and the evacuation is extremely good. The moment that you are going into an attack, uh, you have got much larger numbers of, of wounded and you've got the difficulty of getting them from where they were. Uh, now, people are extremely heavy. Uh, so it, could, it takes at least two, possibly four men to carry a stretcher. If uh, frontline soldiers turn around to assist the wounded, for every man who's wounded, you lose four uh, riflemen, which degrades your ability to fight. So uh, the stretcher bearers, um, uh, who are normally members of the band, as it happens, um, uh, you have got a number of those whose job it is to get the um, wounded back, at least as far as Battalion HQ, where there will be an aid post. And at that point, the RAMC and the field ambulance are supposed to take the weight and evacuate casualties. The feeling was that those um, uh, facilities were simply not far forward enough and there weren't enough people in them. Once they've got you back as far as an aid post um, or, to, or to a dressing station and then to a casualty clearing station, your chances are as good um, uh, as the medical practice of, of the time will allow. Uh, but it's that piece between being shot and actually getting to a member of the RAMC that are the problem. Thanks for that, Fraser. Um, I, don't, um, I don't know if Mary could, uh, uh, Mary could hear so that. I'm, I'm into Mary because of the sound issues. Let me just, let me, um, let me just see if... Just unmute you. Mary, did, Mary, did you get yes, the gist of the answer? Is that okay? Yes, I heard that. Thank you. No worries. I actually got it. Good. Yeah. Right, okay, I think, 
everybody who I've promoted to panelists, which is a few people who have actually asked the question. Um, I think, Fraser, in fairness, it's now 25 to 10. We, we've... we've, uh, <laughs> we've Kept you on, on quite a quite a long time there. So look, uh, I'm going to wrap it up at this stage. So uh, Fraser, that has been absolutely tremendous. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Um, without um, being too um, uh, too Yorkshire about this, this has obviously proved the fact that uh, West Yorkshire did in fact win the war. Which uh, quite clearly uh, there will be uh, some substantial disagreement. Uh, about that, but uh, uh, I think my, my, my mind is is more or less made up um, that not it was ever in any doubt. So uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that um, super presentation, brilliant, um, brilliant set of um, images that you've you've shown to illustrate your talk, and I am very grateful. Uh, if everybody who has enjoyed this wishes to um, register for next week's, please do so. Um, next week's. Um, will be uh, Spencer Jones, um, and hopefully we'll have a good, another good turnout there. But uh, on behalf of everybody, Fraser, uh, many thanks indeed for a wonderful presentation. Thanks very much indeed. Good night. Good talking to you all. Thanks again, Fraser. Thank you.